Our God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. Come on, our God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Hey, hey, family. Mr. Walker and Wanda, God bless you. Mr. Penny. Sister Washington, God bless you, family. Sister Rob, Sister Rob Yarborough and Sister Wilson, Sister Aretha, Shadow, Babe. God bless you. All right. He heals me when I'm broken. Share with somebody now. Share with somebody. Sister Crawford, bless you. Hey, Sister Denise, 
everyone good evening good evening good evening god bless you glad for you to come in for bible study tonight i know there's a lot going on a lot of distractions with the election that's going on um but that's not in our hands we have our kingdom building god is good and he's worthy to be praised i want you to continue to play for the horton family art and janice and Steve and um, Keith and I mean Keith and Fats uh, continue to pray for them in the loss of Steve. Steve was a good friend of ours and a member of our church family and we had his home going. So we're just praying for that my entire family. Um, just want to remind you we are having a food drive. Um, it's 1020 Coldwater Road on tomorrow. Um, uh, that's the old Beecher High School um, right in front of the Russ Reynolds football field where they play football. We'll have a food drive starting at 10 a.m. in the morning. So if you need some, some produce and some food, come on out and get it tomorrow. Um, I want to jump right into Bible study today. Um, Matthew 6 chapter, we've been dealing with the model prayer. Um um, it says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be that your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And last week we talked about give us today our daily bread. And tonight we're going to be on verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we have also as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So last Thursday, let's just have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask that we pray that your word goes forth with power and conviction so that lives might be changed and we get deeper into studying and knowing what it is to pray to you as our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So last Thursday we talked about give us today our daily bread. And we talked about, we talked about bread meaning that which is necessary for survival. And that when you pray this model prayer, what you're saying get something straight back here. And so when we talk about bread, we talk about bread meaning that which is necessary for survival. And that when you pray this model prayer, what you're saying is that the first thing that I, I acknowledge is God is my father. The second thing is that we acknowledge is that God's name is holy. The third thing is that I recognize that I'm operating under God's will and not mine. The fourth thing is that I need is for my father to supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. I, and then I acknowledge that I can't make it without him. When I'm praying to God, I need to always pray and let him know I can't. There's nothing I can do without him. I'm leaning and depending on, on my father. And my request for bread is not for the extras in life. But what I'm requesting for is God to supply my needs and not necessarily my wants. But also that the request is not a selfish request. This is not just for myself. It said, give us today our daily bread. 
So this petition is not just about me, but it also includes my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now in 12, in verse 12, the verse, this verse, Jesus moves from our physical needs to our spiritual needs. He begins to deal with this thing called forgiveness. Let everybody say this thing. Everybody say forgiveness, 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 forgiveness. That's a tough word to swallow. This, this is kind of tough tonight. So he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. King James Version says the evildoers. The Lord uses the word forgive two times in verse 12. Then he uses the word two times in verse 14. And then again, two times in verse 15. You need to listen carefully when the Holy Spirit keeps repeating itself. One of the greatest benefits that you and I can have is the benefit of being forgiven. Matter of fact, there's nothing on earth that supersedes being able to forgive and to be forgiven. The Greek definition for the word forgiveness means to sin away, to sin away. And what Jesus is saying in this prayer is that we have to ask God to forgive us for the debt of sin, the debt of sin. Matthew 6, verse 14 says, for if you forgive men, this is Matthew 6, verse 14 says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men for their sins, your father, listen how important this is, your father will not forgive your sins. Wow, that's pretty deep. So Jesus is teaching us how to hear how to pray and ask God to forgive us and send the debt of sin away. And so if Jesus is asking the Father to forgive us, then we have no other choice. I'm telling you, we have no other choice but to forgive our brothers and sisters. And I, and I don't care what they've done to you, how they've missed you, misused you, how they've crossed you, whatever they've done for you, you have to find it. And this, this scripture simply says, if you don't forgive somebody for their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I'm not talking about what I got to say. I'm talking about what the word of God has to say tonight. So some of you need to think about some of the relationships where you're still angry with people. You still have not gotten over what somebody's done to you. You still have not forgiven them. The Bible says that there is no room for you not to forgive them if you want your father in heaven to forgive you. Mark 11 and 25 says, and when you stand praying, if you hold, listen to what Mark 25 says. You need to listen to these scriptures carefully tonight because a lot of us, we, we, we have an issue with forgiveness. Mark 11 and 25 says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, it first says when you're praying, if you hold anything against anyone, Forgive him, forgive her, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Well, let, let's, let's, let's talk about this thing called sin this evening. What's this thing called sin? Sin means to miss the mark. God lays out a target according to the Bible. And when we aim, we miss that target. We miss the mark. The King James Version translation uses the word trespass. It means to slip and fall. You're walking and you accidentally, you accidentally slip and fall. And the reason I give you the word accidentally now is because there's so many people who intentionally slip and fall so they can sue somebody. Galatians 6 and 1 says that, says that you can be overtaken in a fault. That means that you slip and fall. You had no intention of doing it. You were, you were blindsided. That means, let me give you an illustration. That means when you left home on your way to Tim and Horton to get some coffee and bagels, you did not know that this fine sister, this fine brother was going to be at Tim Horton's. You were not going to Tim Horton's to meet anybody. Then all of a sudden you find more than just coffee and donuts. That's, that's what's called a slip and fall. Now there's another word called transgressions, which is another word for sin. And it means to step across the line or to, cross over the fence, 
to disregard or violate the law. And the other word for sin is lawless. 1 Timothy 1, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. And then verse 9 says, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy. And it goes on and on talking about devious people and devious behavior. Behavior, <clears throat> excuse me. So it comes from the idea of doing something intentional. That call that comes from the idea of something flagrant. Any, 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 if anybody knows anything about sports, you have what's called flagrant fouls or intentionally making contact or trying to hurt somebody. In other words, you you intend to hurt somebody. I found out that I found out that there are some people who are in the body of Christ. They spend all their time committing flagrant fouls. They're not trying to block your shot. They're not trying to play good defense, but they're intentionally trying to hurt you with your tongue. There are more people ran away from the body of Christ, the body of believers, by somebody else's tongue, by backbiters, by somebody being on their back, by somebody talking about them. And the bad thing about it is sometimes we don't even know the person that we're hurting. But we want to see someone fall so bad, we want to see someone cry the uh, flagrant fouls. Then, this is, then there's this word, the word debt in this prayer is a very important word, debt. Forgive us our debts. The word debt, a Greek word, oaleia, oalema, which means dues, duty, duties which are owed. Duties which are owed. In relation to sin, it means a failure to pay your debt or a failure to do one's duty. A failure to do your duty or responsibility. And what that's talking about is your, a failure to do your duty or your responsibility in the kingdom. In this season, we as believers in Christ all have a duty to do in the kingdom. And your failure to do your duty is what's considered a debt. See, God has given each of us a responsibility, certain things to do and certain things not to do. Every one of us has failed, every one of us has failed at some point in our lives to carry out God's will. So this prayer is asking God to do three things, to forgive the debt of sin. When we fail, when we fail to do what we're supposed to do for kingdom building, we need God to forgive us because that's a sin. Second, to forgive the debt of guilt or punishment. And a lot of us get stuck because we can't forgive. A lot of us get stuck in guilt. When you don't pay your debts, listen to this. When you don't pay your debts, you're guilty. So if you don't pay your debts of sin, you're guilty and you face punishment of judgment. Number three is to forgive debts just if you have been forgiven. Remember this, this is important. If I ask God to forgive me, if I can't forgive you, if I can't forgive somebody else, it cancels out God's forgiving me. So if any person who holds anything against another person, then you're not forgiven for your sins. No matter what you think or what somebody else tells you, the Bible says you're not forgiven for your sins. You see, whenever there's sin, sin requires a debt to be paid. You have a responsibility or an obligation. If I owe a brother, if I owe a brother a thousand dollars, and the brother writes it off and tells me I don't owe him, I, and that I don't have to pay it, then it cost that brother a thousand dollars. It didn't just disappear. He he wrote it off, so he incurred the loss. The Bible says that the wages of sin are death. Death means, in that terms, separation from God. So if God says to me, Aldrich, that's all right. You don't have to die. Somebody has already paid the debt. Well, the songwriter said that Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. And sin has left a crimson stain. But he, somebody knows it, he washed it white as snow. Sin is a, a serious problem. And the Bible clearly states that we're all guilty. 
Sin makes us guilty. When we're guilty, we must face judgment. All of us listening this evening are standing before God guilty. And I know that some of you live and denial that you've never done anything wrong in your life. Some of you actually believe that you were born with a tambourine in your hand and a halo over your head. But Romans 3.23 says all, not just y'all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and 10 says there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who goes good, does good. It looks like it looks like somebody held up their hand and said, well, what about me when Paul was writing it? Paul says, don't even try it. Not even one. Paul says that all of us are guilty. Then if all of us are guilty, then all of us need some forgiveness. And forgiveness is offered by God through his son, Jesus Christ. All of us have been forgiven. And the only way that we can get in the family of God is that we had to be forgiven. All of us are sitting on death row waiting to be executed. We've been condemned for breaking God's law. But oh, thank God for Jesus Christ. Well, when did my, well, when did my forgiveness take place? How did my forgiveness take place? When I applied Romans 10 and 9 in my life, confess with my mouth that Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, and here's the real important part of this. When I, when I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart, because a lot of us will make the confession but not have the belief. So I have to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible says that thou shall be saved. Now, there's some of you that would ask the question, what if you die while you're committing a sin? Well, the Bible says that when you've accepted Christ, your yesterday's sins, your today's sins, and your tomorrow's sins are forgiven at that time. Well, some of you probably ask, where does it say that? I was looking at Hebrews 10, Hebrews the 10th chapter, and I'm gonna, I want to read this to you. Hebrews the 10th chapter, starting at the... 11th verse. It says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice, he's talking about Jesus Christ, one time, one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And the Bible says, I want to read that a little bit further. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he has their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. I thank God for knowing that. I just thank God. So you see now that my, my sin debt has been paid, it does not mean have to be paid twice. But it does not mean that I can live any kind of way. We're supposed to live holy, righteous lives. We're talking about forgiveness this evening. Let me say this. You can sin by doing the wrong things, and then you can also sin by not doing something the Lord said that you should have done. You know, we talk about omission and commission, but I'm going to keep it simple tonight. You see, some of us think that you're only guilty of committing sin when you do something wrong, but you can commit sin by doing nothing. I'm going to tell this real quick story. The supervisor walked up to one of his employees and just looked at him and said, you're fired. I'm firing you right now. The man said, you fired me and I didn't do anything. There was another man standing around and said, that's why you got fired because you weren't doing nothing. But all of us 
You see, some of us think that we can sit and do nothing and be okay with God. But you can be guilty of committing a sin in your doing nothing. We got so much work to do. You know, last week we talked about the fields are ripe, but the laborers are food. Field in this season, we have to call people. We have to check on people. We have to pray for people. Even if we have to stay safe, there's so much that we be need to be doing as a body of believers to make people make sure that people stay connected with the body of Christ. Even if we don't do anything but connect and share with somebody when live streams are coming on and when you're on certain Bible studies or whatever you're doing, you need to make sure that there are people, your family members, whoever, are still going the church in this day and in this season, the best way we can go to church. You know, if God died for you and I, and he gave us a commission, he said, we're the light of the world. We're a city that sits on a hill. He said that we're his witnesses. If the Lord has raised you up from the pits of hell, kept you, gave you food to eat, a home to live in, and you can't ever tell anybody about his goodness, you can't ever give him credit for where he's brought you from and what he's done from you. You know, some of us have the nerve to brag about our, our education. I made it to where I am because of my background. I know a whole lot of people who have master degrees and all kinds of experience that are homeless. So if you got a job or you just get a check each month, or maybe you don't have anything coming in right now, but you got a roof over your head and you had food to eat last night, you need to tell the Lord, thank you. Somebody needs to tell him thank you if he's just done anything for you today. If you're just able to look on the live stream tonight and be coming in, you need to tell the Lord thank you. And you need to tell somebody else what he's doing for you and what he's done for you. You know, some of us now as Christians, we don't even tell our children where our money comes from. We're always talking about what's mine. Well, it's not ours. God, everything that we have, everything that we've got, God gave it to us. We haven't earned anything on our own. And when you fail to tell him thank you and praise him for what he's done, that's a sin of ingratitude. So all of us need to recognize that we've been forgiven. Hmm, we've been forgiven. Notice the text. Forgive us our debts as we have, have forgiven our debtors. You see, God is not judging us as a judge in this prayer because Jesus opened this prayer up with our Father. In Matthew 14 and, and 36, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and he starts his prayer off with, off to God, Abba. And you remember I gave you that word a, a, a couple of weeks ago, Abba. This is an Aramaic word which communicates intimacy. It's probably best translated, like I said before, as daddy. So God is not judging me like he does not know me. He recognizes me as his child. And since I'm his child, he looks at me different than he would if he did not know me. If any of my children goes astray and gets into trouble, they're still my children, even if they never speak to me again. They're still my children. You know, they can get out of fellowship with me, but they're still in the family. And that's what this prayer is saying. You can't fail to forgive your brother or your sister because you're all still in, we're all still in the same family. But you can sometimes be out of fellowship. You see, when somebody in your family hurts you, that does not change their position in the family. They're still in the family. But some of the past, what happens is some of the passion of the relationship leaves. You stop talking to each other as much. You stop coming around each other as much. And what Jesus is saying is that when you fail to forgive your brother and your sister, you hurt your heavenly father. Because the father does not like to see his children arguing and fighting with each other. Our daddy does not like to see us divided against one another. And that's what God is saying to us. God is saying you, you can act holy on Sundays, shout on Sundays, and then give your brothers and sisters the finger right after service. God says that bothers me. 
Let me show you what happens when you have a problem with your brother and the sister. When you, when, when, let me show you what happens when you have a problem with your brother and your sister. Psalms 51. David had gotten caught in what we call sexual sins. Not only did he get caught, he was responsible for a man losing his life. And because of his sin, he lost his fellowship with God. There might be somebody listening this evening that, that does not realize that if you repented because of the blood of Jesus, that God has forgiven you, but you've not forgiven yourself. And when you sit around with sins and you don't forgive yourself, it can take something out of you. So in Psalm 51, David says, when you get caught up in a sin, it can make you feel real dirty. He says in verse two, wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse from me my sin. And then verse 11, he says, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit away from me. That David is saying that even though I've sinned, I'm still in the presence of the Lord. Even though I've sinned, I, I, I'm still in the family, but I've lost something. Then, then in verse 12, he, he prays to the Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Now, he did not say restore my salvation, but what he says is give me my joy back. You see, there comes a time in your life if you don't walk in forgiveness that you can lose your joy. Because, you know, if you don't forgive a person, they got control over you because you spend too much time worried about them and worried about being angry with them. And that will cause you to lose your joy. You'll find yourself out of fellowship. And in this season, the enemy wants you to get out of fellowship. See, we're caught between a thin line right now because the cult, with the COVID rising and more people getting sick, and I as a pastor, I want to be in fellowship with you in service. But I have to make a decision whether to risk the ones I love getting sick by asking you to come back to worship. Or do I trust God enough to believe that how we're worshiping right now is the way we need to worship for now until God says, it's time for us to go back until God changes the season and, and makes it okay for us to go back. So what I need you to do is encourage those that are not as strong as you to get on live streams. Now, I'm not talking about the coming necessarily to the second chance live stream, but they need to be on somebody's live stream right now that's teaching the word of God, teaching the principles of God, and they need to be able to worship God the best way we can right now and learn about his promises. And that's the only way we're going to keep people connected so when churches do open back up, people will come back out and serve him. Because if not, you will end up losing the joy of your salvation. Can you remember when we were worshiping before this pandemic and you'd see a brother and sister join church and they would be on fire for the Lord and they would be sitting up front and they would join the choir and they would join the usher board and and after a while, they would be sitting in the middle of the church. And a little bit later on, they would be sitting in the back of the church. And pretty soon, you would, you would see them. They'd be missing few, from one Sunday to the next. And, and pretty soon, they, they'd be missing all together. You know why? Because they lost their something caused them to lose their joy. David says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me, to carry me through COVID, to carry me through rough times, to carry me through storms. Give, sustain, give me a willing spirit and sustain me. Give me my joy back. I need my, I can't make it in this season without my joy. There's too much chaos going on. There's too much mess. Going on. I've got to have some joy to even have some peace. The Lord says there are several reasons that you need to forgive your brother and your sister. Ephesians 2 and 8 says that, is by, that it is by grace that we are saved through faith. And this, this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. All of us share the same grace. I don't care where you are on the totem pole. All of us share that same grace. We're only here because of the grace of God. Every one of us are guilty of something. You may not be guilty of what I am, but we're all guilty of something. I'm going to tell another story. There were two men 
who bet on who could jump the fathers across the ditch. One man said to the other man, I'll buy you lunch if you can jump further than I can. So the man ran and jumped and he missed the other side of the ditch by two inches. The second man said, okay. And he went way back and got a long running start. He jumped as high as he could with all his might and he missed the ditch by about one inch. It didn't make sense for one man to start bragging to the other one because they were both in the ditch. You see, when you really think about it, if it had not been for the grace of God, all of us would be in a ditch. If it had not been for his grace and his mercy, every one of us would be somewhere in a ditch. So that's why we need to forgive our brothers and sisters as quickly as we can. When we carry a grudge too long, it starts eating you from the inside out. Ephesians 4 and 26, be ye angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. The Holy Spirit says, don't carry it behind the day because it will start eating at you at night. As I close, I want you to look at Jesus. He's hanging out on Calvary's cross. They nailed his hands. They put spikes in his feet. They pierced him in his side. They put a crown of thorns on his head. Jesus looks up and says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And I said, Jesus, why are you making excuses for those low-down, dirty people that hung you? Are you trying to tell me they were, when they were nailing your hands, you did not know it? Jesus says, Jesus, are you trying to say when they were putting spikes in your feet, you didn't know it? Jesus says, that's not what I'm saying. He says, they knew they were nailing spikes in my hand but they didn't know whose hands they were nailing. They knew that they were putting spikes in my feet, but they didn't know it was the master's feet. They knew they were putting a crown of thorns on my head, but they didn't know it was the savior's head. I heard, overheard Jesus say in Matthew 25, what you do unto the least one, you're doing also to me. And so he said in this position, when you pray, while you're on your knees saying, give me, Lord, don't get up before you say, forgive me, Lord. Because asking for something before you ask for forgiveness is like a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Psalms 85 and 2. He says, not only do I cover your sins, he says, I get amnesia about your sins. He says in the book of Hebrew, I remember your sins no more. God says, not only do I cover your sins, but he says in the book of Job that I'll put your sins in a bag. Micah says he will cast your sins in a sea. He says, just in case you've been trying to find your sins, he says, your sins cannot be found. But I stopped by to tell you this evening, if you really want forgiveness, there must be a confession. And you don't have to confess to me or anybody else that's listening. Don't tell your business to nobody because they're going to put it out there on Facebook. Because when you confess your sins, most people just want to hear about your weaknesses and your faults. When you confess your sins, all you're saying is, God, I agree with you. Everything that you've said about me is true. First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us. And that means he cleanses me over and over and over again. I'm glad that I'm serving a God that says, I got to treat everybody right. That I can't hold a grudge against my brother and sister. I have to recognize that when you mistreat me, I need to start thinking about who I mistreated. I am glad that I serve a God that makes me realize that I need forgiveness just like you need forgiveness. I'm glad about it. So when you pray, say, forgive us our debts as we as also have forgiven our debtors. And then what God does is after we've asked for forgiveness, the God I serve come behind us and, and, and with goodness and mercy and cleans up everything that we have messed up. Uh, the, because the Bible says he gives us fresh mercy, new mercies every day. You see, the mercy you got today won't do for tomorrow. The mercy you got yesterday won't do for today. You need fresh mercy every morning. I thank him for giving me and dying for my sins. Forgive us our debts as we